Okay, so we're just going to wait a minute here as uh, as people uh, are let in. Okay, um, well, good evening and um, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have what's sure to be a, an informative uh, and illuminating event uh, for you this evening about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, whose life and lessons of power are chronicled in a new biography, Madam Speaker, by veteran journalist Susan Page. A couple of brief housekeeping, uh, uh, housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at any point during the event, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the chat function uh, uh, is there as well, but it's, uh, it's been uh, deactivated uh, for, for this event. Uh, so just channel your questions into the, the, the Q&A. Uh, Susan is uh, the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today and one of the most prominent political reporters working today. She's covered seven White House administrations and 11 presidential elections. She's interviewed the past 10 presidents and reported from six continents and dozens of foreign countries. Former president of the White House Correspondents Association and the Gridiron Club, she's received all three journalism prizes given for White House coverage. In the past few years, she's also proven herself a talented biographer. In her first book several years ago, The Matriarch, Susan profiled Barbara Bush, and, uh, and Madam Speaker, she's applied the same thorough reporting to profiling Nancy Pelosi, drawing on scores of interviews and other research, including 10 extended conversations with the House Speaker. Susan provides a textured, detailed account of Pelosi's path-breaking rise to power and how she's wielded her authority. In a review today, the Los Angeles Times said even longtime watchers of Pelosi will learn something new, uh, new about her from Susan's book. Now, leading the discussion with Susan this evening will be one of the most expert and experienced interviewers around, veteran radio broadcaster Diane Rehm. Diane started hosting a local morning talk show in 1979 on WAMU, the NPR member station in Washington. Program renamed the Diane Ream Show a few years later was distributed nationally and internationally by NPR and lasted several decades until Diane retired from it in 2016. Susan uh, even often uh, served as a guest host on the show. In recent years, Diane has hosted a weekly podcast and she's also the author of several popular autobiographical works and a book last year, When My Time Comes, about the end of life care and right to die movement. So uh, Susan and Diane, the screen is yours. Thank you, Brad. Good to have you, Susan, and see you again. I just want to, first of all, congratulate you on this book. It's terrific. Di Diane, thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be interviewed by Diane Green, from whom I learned so much. <laughs> Well, first of all, I want to know what Nancy Pelosi's first reaction was when you said, I want to do a book about you. Well, um, I want to, I, what, what I said for, first, not to her directly, but to her deputy chief of staff was, I've signed a contract to do a book about her, and I certainly hope she'll be willing to let me interview her. But the same leap of faith I took with Barbara Bush. I had interviewed uh, Nancy Pelosi a couple times over the years uh, in Washington. Never had really covered her on a sort of daily basis. Um, it was so uh, that she agreed first to one interview and then in the end to 10 interviews. I've got to tell you, the first interview, she served Dove Bars uh, at the beginning of the interview. This is a special tree, you know, dark cream coated in dark chocolate. She, she's a well-known chocoholic. I bite into it and scattered shards of little of chocolate covering all over her carpet. And so I spent the opening of this first interview trying to keep from making it my last interview. And <laughs> I, was, 
I was grateful that she let me come back and interview her again. But I have to say, in the other nine interviews, she never again served me any food. But I bet she was gracious about what happened. She gave me the look of a mother. <laughs> <laughs> poor thing, poor thing. So I am fascinated about her beginnings um, and her father and the extraordinary role her father played in the development of Nancy Pelosi's career. Talk about her dad and the relationship the two had. She was the only girl in this large family. Uh, so Tommy D'Alessandro and his wife, Nancy D'Alessandro, had had boys in a row. Nancy D'Alessandro was born. The last child, the only girl, you can only imagine how thrilled they must have been uh, to, to, for her arrival. One of, their, one of their sons had died at an early age. So when she was born, there were five boys and then Nancy. And the one thing I think maybe people don't understand is how prominent her family was. They were as important uh, in Baltimore, as the Kennedy family was in Boston, their every move was critical. Nancy D'Alessandro's De birth in 1940 was all over the newspapers. Why? Because her father was at that point the congressman from Baltimore. And when she was seven, he would be elected the mayor of Baltimore. He was a remarkable larger than life figure. He was kicked out of elementary school when he was 13 out of the St. Leo's parochial school for various uh, misdeeds. Yeah, there was one misdeed that really got the nuns to say, that's it. What was it? Well, he had, he was wearing, he won a little classroom contest and a, 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 a medal, a saint's medal was into his shirt and another boy in his class made fun of it and they got into a fight of them got expelled and of course he was supposed to go back to school to the public schools uh, after being expelled at age 13 he never uh, he never graduated from elementary school or high school or college and yet he became the five-term congressman from baltimore the three-term mayor of baltimore and a big figure um, in the day when the big city mayors were kingmakers in the Democratic Party. He was, he knew FDR, he knew Harry Truman. And there's a picture in the book of Nancy D'Alessandro at age 16 with John F. Kennedy. So he grew up in a family that was prominent and comfortable with power. You know, in a sense, it reminds me a little bit of Cokie Roberts and the manner in which she grew up surrounded uh, by politicians all the way through her life. And Nancy Pelosi and her father, how close were they? And just to mention Cokie Roberts, our, our great friend. Uh, yeah. We miss so much. Cokie Roberts' mother, Lindy Boggs, who was herself a pretty remarkable figure, was an important figure in Nancy Pelosi's life. Uh, she was an early mentor, and there was a point when Nancy Pelosi was uh, not elected in politics, but working in Democratic politics as an organizer right. in California. And she was she told Lindy Boggs that she has gotten this big job, and she had this other big job, so maybe she'd give it up so that she wouldn't have two big jobs. And Lindy Boggs told her, no man would ever do that. <laughs> she said, Nancy, know thy power. And that is a motto that Nancy Pelosi has remembered forever. Isn't that wonderful? That's a great story. So um, how old was Nancy Pelosi's father when he finally moved out of power? Well, he was he had served for uh, a long time in elective office. And he wanted to serve in statewide office. He ran uh, for the U.S. Senate 
and was defeated. He wanted to run for governor. He was defeated in the Democratic primary. And at that point, he moved he moved out of elected politics, but he never moved out of politics. And, um, there was a on the on the primary election night where he did not win the nomination to run for governor. Reporter asked him, "Are you still going to vote for this other candidate who defeated you for the nomination?" And he roared. The reporter wrote, "Roared, of course I am. I was born a Democrat, and I'll die a Democrat, and I'll vote for the Democrat." And there was one. He continued to be a figure of some importance. Ronald Reagan in 1984 was going to Baltimore to unveil a statue of Christopher Columbus. And the White House called the D'Alessandro House to ask if the former mayor would like to ride with the president to this event, which is, of course, something you might consider quite a plum. And Nancy Pelosi's mother answered the phone and reamed out the White House saying, after all the things that Ronald Reagan had done to poor people in this country, they were certainly not gonna go with him to this event. And the manner was so fierce that the White House then called her oldest son, who was at that point himself a former mayor of Baltimore, to ask if she posed a threat to President Reagan's safety. Now, she certainly didn't pose a physical threat to his safety, but a political threat, maybe. No wonder she was called Big Nancy. And then her daughter became known as Little Nancy. That's right, her, her namesake. And someone uh, who, as a little girl, Big Nancy encouraged Little Nancy to consider becoming a nun. Little Nancy then responded, she didn't think she wanted to be a nun. She was more interested, perhaps, in being a priest Authority seemed to be <laughs> good for her. How then did she decide, or did she decide early on that she wanted to follow in her father's footsteps and get involved in politics, or did her marriage and her own large family change all that? You know, she never saw, for decades, she did not see herself as a possible office holder. Um, but she was never out of politics. She was constantly volunteering, first in New York, uh, when they moved uh, after she got married, soon after graduating from college. And then when they moved to San Francisco, uh, she became active as a volunteer, eventually as chairman of the uh, Democratic State Democratic Party, but it was, it's a very classic story, familiar I think to a lot of women of her generation who ran for office. Which it was only when another woman said, "You should run for this office," that she really thought about it seriously. Sally Burton, who was re representing uh, uh, the San Francisco in Congress, was dying of cancer. A friend of Nancy Pelosi and encouraged her to run to succeed her, offered her her endorsement. It was only at that point that Nancy Pelosi seriously considered running for office. Of course, she ran for office. She won a, uh, a contest that has a wild, one of those wild San Francisco contests with 14 candidates in the first primary, and she has never looked back. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, um, Diana and Susan, but um, Susan, your sound is a little scratchy, and I've, I've been hoping it would correct itself, but it's, 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 it's not. You know, I could put on a headset. Should I do that? Try a headset. Make sure everything else in the house. Try it. On the internet. Right. There's nothing else in the house on the internet, but let me, let me put in my headset and we'll just see if that works. Okay. Now it may take just a minute to pick up. Are you now hearing uh, the headset? Yep. Yeah. Hearing and keep talking a little, Susan, and we'll see if it breaks up. Tell me another story about Nancy's early career. Well, she uh, uh, she ran. Here's a little known fact: she was won that hotly contested race in California in 1987, thanks in part to Republican votes. Uh, she had a big Democratic rival, Harry Britt. Uh, who was a member of the San Francisco uh, City Council. And 
he actually prevailed in the predominantly Democratic precincts. But Nancy Pelosi did okay in those precincts. And she had sent out appeals, campaign appeals, into more Republican precincts on the theory that you may prefer a Republican over a Democrat, but a Democrat is going to win this race. You might as well get a Democrat you like better than this other Democrat. So it is Republicans who got Nancy Pelosi started in office. I want to know about her early relationship with her husband, how they met, and why she was willing to move all the way out to the West Coast, leaving her family in Baltimore, whom she loved dearly. So Nancy Pelosi attended Trinity College, it's now Trinity University uh, in Washington, D.C., and she took a summer class at Georgetown, Georgetown University, where Paul Pelosi was attending school. They had some mutual friends. Uh, he showed up at a casual party they were at, and she said, I'm going to go get pick up my dry cleaning, my laundry. And he said, oh, pick up mine, too. And so she <laughs> went to the laundry and picked up her laundry and came back, and he said, where's my laundry? And she said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> and then? And then, but then they uh, had a romance, uh, and after they had both graduated from college, got married, he first uh, went to New York, um, where he had attended graduate school and had a job. Then there was an, he was from San Francisco, uh, and his family was in fact prominent in San Francisco, and there became a point where he was offered a job uh, involving these uh, unfamiliar small companies that were beginning to be established in Silicon Valley. So they moved there, uh, and they have been in San Francisco ever since. You write that she thought that the 2016 election was going to be her farewell to politics, that she was going to do other things that she really wanted to do, that did not necessarily involve politics. And she was just stunned when Donald Trump won the election. She knew Donald Trump. She had talked to him before. They had had a fairly cordial relationship, at least over the phone. Tell us that story. So election night 2016, uh, Nancy Pelosi, like so many of the rest of us, thought Hillary Clinton was going to win that election. Um, she had some early, she was calling around to uh, politicians she trusted in key states, including Bob Brady, uh, who was a big Democrat. He was at that point a member of Congress, but more importantly, had run uh, Philadelphia Democratic politics for some time. His first report was pretty good. The second time she talked to him, he was nervous. The third time he said, it's not going to work here in Pennsylvania. And at that point, she knew the election was not going to go the way she thought. She had been making plans to retire, if uh, assuming Hillary Clinton would win the White House, would protect Democratic interests and priorities. And she said that while she had had, she had raised, actually, she had actually raised campaign funds from Donald Trump years earlier. They didn't have a real relationship, but she was shocked when he won the White House. And she's told me it was like, she felt like she was being kicked by a mule, not metaphorically. She said she physically felt like she was being kicked by, the, by a mule that election night. And by the end of election night, she decided she was not gonna retire. She was gonna stick around. Uh, she was gonna stand up to this very disruptive American president. And we should recall that he contributed money to Democrats while he was presumably a Democrat before he became a Republican. And then once he won the election, what was their relationship like? 
Well, the relationship was interesting because on the one hand, she was standing up to him in their very first White House meeting of President Trump and congressional leaders. He asserted that he had actually won the popular vote because there were so many illegal votes cast uh, on the other side. And she was the one who said that isn't true. That's not a fact. Uh, at a time when everybody else, she said, was staring at their feet. Um, so she was willing to challenge him. But, you know, I interviewed uh, President Trump in 2018, just because before the midterms. And I asked him if he was concerned. I, this was for USA Today. I asked if he was concerned that Democrats look, look like Democrats had a good chance of winning control of the House. And he said he, he did not seem that concerned. He said, I think I can get things done with Nancy Pelosi. They'll want to achieve things, too. Well, as it turned out, of course, it was very bad news for President Trump when Democrats won control of the House that November. Nancy Pelosi became speaker and it was up to her when he was impeached for what he was impeached and what the reception that his his proposals would get in the U.S. House. What was the meeting when she actually pointed her finger <laughs> at him? So this was actually the last time the two of them have talked. It was in October of 2019. Uh, it was at the point that uh, impeachment was going to happen, uh, and he knew that. The meeting was supposed to be at Syri about Syria, but in fact, it became about the grievances between them. She stood up, jammed her finger at him. The White House took a photo. The White House immediately after the meeting put the photo out, thinking it made her look unhappy. She immediately made it her banner photo on social media and used it for fundraising because it made her look like she was in control. The Democrats in that meeting followed her, marched out of the meeting. Uh, Nancy, uh, Donald Trump said to uh, Steny Hoyer that Pelosi was a third rate politician. Steny Hoyer told me he didn't hear him say that. And if he had, he would have said, if Nancy Pelosi is a third rate politician, you're a fifth rate politician. Wasn't that the day she had on that bright red coat or suit and went immediately out and spoke with the press after that meeting? So there are a couple kind of iconic pictures of Nancy Pelosi. The one in October 2019, she's wearing blue. It was after the first meeting that they had in the Oval Office after Democrats had won control of the House that she that he sat down with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and had a very tough time of it. And then she comes out onto the where the reporters are uh, at the entrance of the White House and just looks again completely in command. That red coat wearing sunglasses. We've seen that because now it's on coffee mugs and uh, uh, computer pads everywhere, the picture of her in that red coat. In fact, she said that it was a little, she wore the red coat not because she thought it was a big symbol. She wore it because it was clean. It had just come back from the dry cleaner and it was kind of a nippy day. And now she can hardly wear the coat because people think it sends such a message. There is another iconic photograph of Nancy Pelosi, one I saw happen in real time, and that was when Donald Trump delivered his State of the Union address. And when he walked in, how did he address Mitch McConnell, and how did he address Nancy Pelosi? So he, he didn't really address Nancy Pelosi. He didn't offer her the traditional words of welcome. Uh, he handed her a text of his State of the Union speech as is, as is customary. She kind of returned the favor by not, when she introduced him to the, uh, to the hall, to the chamber, she did not use traditional words of praise <laughs> that speakers usually use when they introduce a president in that situation. And, you know, this, this was, an, assuming you're referring to the 2020 State of the Union address, this was where uh, she tore up the speech at the end. She tore it up. And I can tell you, we, I, she told me how that happened. Uh, she said that she was sitting there reading the text to see what he was going to say. And she wanted to make a notation because she said she saw something that was factually inaccurate. And she looks around 
and she doesn't have a pen. And there's a little drawer there, and she opens the little drawer, and there's no pen in it. There's no pen. So she makes a little tear in the margin of the paper, so I can get back to that because it's something that's not true. And she found herself making tear after tear after tear on the speech because she found so many things that she said were false. And she said, she said he decided at the end of it that he had shredded the truth. So she might as well shred his speech. She stood up. I've never seen anything like it. She tore his speech in half. She tore it again four times in all. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence is standing next to her applauding, pretending he cannot see what is going on right next to him. Susan, that's a wonderful story. I can just see her making those little tears in each page. I want to take you back a little bit before we go forward even more, and that is to Nancy Pelosi, the mother. Tell me about those years for her. So she has five children, uh, all in, in close order. How many years? In five, in six years and a week, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, so quite a rapid pace. Uh, when she gave the a speech to her alma mater at Trinity College, she called it the Catholic way. Uh, they definitely had a lot of children fast. Um, and she was an extremely organized mother her children described their childhood almost as though it was military so uh they would all have dinner everyone would clear their place uh they would lay out their clothes for the next day they would line up to do their pack their school lunches military style um she would run clothes through the washer and the dryer and then they would have to go in and grab what they wanted from the dryer. She sometimes dressed them in the same color so she could keep track of them. <laughs> so she had she so she had a highly organized uh, operation there, but it was not always under control. I think any mother would sympathize. She said sometimes she would drive the carpool uh, to take to drive the kids to school and she would have a coat over her nightgown because she had not managed to get dressed by then. But I mean, it was a way to cope with that number of children. Speaking with the children did you glean any resentment or backlash? I I did not. In fact, the family, to the, to the degree an outsider can tell, seems to be very close. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, they, her daughter Christine Pelosi, who is active, the one, the daughter, the child who is most active politically, active in California Democratic politics, a possible successor to her mother. Uh, when her mother chooses to retire from the house, told me uh, that it was a way that her mother perfected the art of building coalitions. Because with two parents and five children, sometimes you'd have three children on one side and two on the other, and sometimes it'd be, uh, you know, four and one, and that she perfected the ability to figure out what it was people really wanted and get them to some unified conclusion. And those are, of course, exactly the skills you need when you're a congressional leader. However, how effective was she, is she as a campaigner? Well, she's a great fundraiser. She's raised more money uh, than any previous congressional yeah. leader, huge right. amounts of money. Um, she is not a great speaker. She's not an orator. Uh, she's not an inspirational speaker. She's not, um, she's not, her skill is not in the kind of back and forth of the Sunday morning shows, the Sunday morning TV shows. She does a lot of those interviews, uh, but it's not really what she excels at. She excels at the inside game of politics. She has learned some of the outside game of politics. In that way, she's more like her, her mother, who was an organizer, than she is like her father, who was a very big public figure. Huh. And how old were her mother and father when they died? Well, her father died, uh, so that's a good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer. They both lived pretty full lives, lives well after he had retired from politics. Um, 
and her mother died just a couple years ago uh very um proud of her daughter and very interested in advancement of women in washington uh she would her mother in baltimore would tear out articles about women getting big appointments the first woman to be appointed this or the first woman elected that and she would send them to her daughter nancy pelosi with notes saying tell them good luck from me but do you really think her mother saw her daughter's future in politics. Well, one one of her classmates, one of Nancy D'Alessandro's classmates told me that because Nancy had been born as, you know, the, the seventh child, the first daughter, that she, think, she thinks that big Nancy had made a deal with God, that if God had, would just give her a daughter, she would make <laughs> the daughter a nun. Hence the encouragement to Nancy, her daughter Nancy, to little Nancy, to become a nun. I th- I think her 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 mother was really a woman ahead of her time. She was ambitious and smart and kind of restless. She when she got out of high school, she worked as a as an auctioneer. That is a very untraditional job uh, for a girl who has just graduated from Catholic girls high school she very much wanted to go to law school and she tried hard when she had six kids at home she tried she enrolled in law school at night but then soon three of her boys got sick she had to stay home that ambition was never realized now we've got lots of questions coming in But before we go to them, I want to ask you, after she got elected to the House, how did she become Democratic whip in 2011, a spot that everybody thought was going to go to Steny Hoyer of Maryland? Yes, uh, interesting. You know, the title of the book, I went through a couple titles, but the title that stuck is Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power. And the number one lesson of power that she learned from her father was nobody is going to give you power. You have to seize it. That is advice that she gave to politicians over the years. It's advice she took herself. It's the advice she followed when she ran for Democratic whip when everybody, including Steny Hoyer, thought Steny Hoyer was going to be the next Democratic whip. It was a race that lasted for three years. Wow. Uh, because they there was no, the Democrats had to win back. You had to have an opening. She ran, she started her campaign before there was actually an opening for Democratic whip. Three year campaign. And at the end of it, she won. And she has never lost her step since then. How did she and Steny Hoyer get along after that? So their rivalry is pretty famous on Capitol Hill. Uh, they, you know, um, they both wanted a job. One of them got it. She would be number one from then on. He would be number two. He's still, you know, he's now the majority leader. So he's they're still in that one-two position. Um, they had the kind of rivalry you might expect from two people, two ambitious people who were in that situation. Their relationship now, I think, is more cordial than it's been in the past. They've, of course, worked together closely for many years, but I don't think either of them ever forgot the fight between them. So let's talk about her relationship with George W. Bush. What was that like? It was tough. Uh, You know, she was the top member of Congress, the senior member of Congress to oppose the war in Iraq from its beginning. Um, And she was a fierce opponent of the war. And she urged uh, George W. Bush over and over again and did everything she could legislatively and persuasively to get him to withdraw U.S. troops from Iraq. She thought that- Well, and she called it the biggest mistake America had ever made. The biggest, she told me that, the biggest mistake America has ever made. That is pretty serious stuff. The two of them had actually stopped talking for months when the 2008 financial crisis erupted and they began to deal with each other again because of the need to pass some big legislation. But they, she was very critical 
of George W. Bush and his leadership, and a lot of it stemmed from the war in Iraq. And is that what made her a lightning rod for the right? Well, she's a pretty liberal Democrat. Yeah. Um, and uh, Republicans found they could raise a lot of money by demonizing Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and they her, did. And they did. Uh, San Francisco liberal, they called her. Uh, uh, she, she, she said that that was, she thought that was, uh, I think, some, some degree she was easy to de demonize because she's female. Uh, we know that in politics, sometimes women are easier to demonize. Uh, she also was liberal, and she had one of her causes at the very beginning of her camp of her career was dealing with HIV/AIDS, uh, and she thought there might be some overtones of that in the characterization that Republicans gave her as being out of the mainstream or not consistent with American values. And when Barack Obama came in, she was enormously proud of getting the Health Care Act passed. Yes, and deserved a lot of the credit for getting it passed. There was a she point was where... annoyed. She was annoyed that Barack Obama did not give her the credit she deserved for that. And she she was she was annoyed that the white she never complained to me about Obama himself but about the White House not giving her the credit she deserved, uh, which she clearly did deserve. I have to tell you, when I interviewed President Obama for the book, he gave her a lot of credit and said it would not have passed without her. And actually, even at the time it passed, Hill, I interviewed Hillary Clinton for the book as well. She said that when the Affordable Care Act passed, she was traveling abroad. She called President Obama to congratulate him. And that night, Obama said to her, the person you should thank for this is Nancy Pelosi. Ah, uh, finally. All right, let's uh, see what people would like to know. First question from RJ. How would you describe the relationship Nancy Pelosi has with President Biden so far? So I think it's very good. Uh, I interviewed her just last week, as a matter of fact, not for the book, but for USA Today. And she described Biden as a transformative president. She said he's had so much experience on Capitol Hill, they can speak in shorthand. Wow. Um, and I think that a lot of people have been surprised at how bold uh, President Biden has gone on policy. Uh, she said she wasn't surprised by that, but she was pleased by that. Uh, by the kind of uh, really ambitious legislation he's been pursuing. So I think that they have a really good relationship. And on the other hand, how would you describe the relationship between Speaker Pelosi and Senator McConnell? <laughs> what did you learn about their relationship in writing the book? So she told me that Mitch McConnell, of course, they're on policy grounds, they are constantly at odds uh, because Mitch McConnell's a conservative Republican and she's a liberal Democrat. But she said that uh, she criticized Mitch McConnell for not standing up to Donald Trump on issues that involve democratic principles. She said he was an enabler of some of the evil of the Trump era. And they had one particular dispute that had not been previously reported. Now, Nancy Pelosi didn't tell me about this, but I have two sources who did tell me about it. Pelosi went to Mitch McConnell and said, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and said, I would like her to lie in state in the rotunda as a sign of respect for her work on equal rights and her service on the Supreme Court. And Mitch McConnell said, no because there wasn't a precedent for someone who had only, only been a Supreme Court justice to lie in state. Wow. And she went ahead and had the, had the justice lie in state, but she had to do it on the House side in Statuary Hall because Mitch McConnell wouldn't allow it. And that made her mad. So at this point, what, how would you describe their relationship? I think it's pretty poisonous. Uh, I think uh, I, you know, uh, you, you don't. There's not a lot of bipartisanship going on on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Uh, and I think they do not have 
the relationship that's going to make that easier. You know, uh, she got along pretty well with John Boehner, uh, the Republican leader in the House. She has gotten along with some uh, uh, Republicans. She had a lot of respect for John McCain, but I think she and Mitch McConnell are just really at loggerheads. But January 6th, take us back to that. And what happened on that day and where Nancy Pelosi was and the comments that Mitch McConnell made after that um, second impeachment was over and then what he said later. Let me tell you about January 6th, because <clears throat> that is something I have talked to Speaker Pelosi about. On January 6th, she was up presiding over the House, uh, you know, for the official uh, counting of the electoral uh, uh, ballots. Yeah. Um, and her security came to her and said, you have to you have to leave. And she didn't think it was something so very serious. She thought she would be back soon. She left her phone up there because she thought, I'm going to leave and I'm going to be back in a few minutes and it's going to be all right. Uh, but of course, it wasn't all right. They, they took her to a secure location with some other of the other congressional leaders. Meanwhile, this mob is careening through the Capitol, some of them shouting her name. They stormed her office. Uh, one man put his feet up on her desk, I saw. left an left a abusive note for her. Uh, and I asked her if they had caught her if her security had not gotten her out of there in time, would they have killed her? And she said, yes, that was what they were setting Whoa. out to do. And then Whoa. she said, but you know, they would have had a battle on their hands because I'm a street fighter. And then <laughs> we're sitting uh, in the speaker's office uh, in two chairs and she lifts up her foot and points to her four inch stilettos and says, Besides, I would have used these as a weapon. Wow. Wow. So then, that's my little dog, Bella. You know Bella. I'll have to introduce her to the audience. She has to get into every podcast and every event I do. So um, then, talk about Mitch McConnell's statement at the end of that impeachment process. So, of course, Mitch McConnell fought impeachment, uh, guaranteed that 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 uh, uh, President Trump would not be convicted. Although after the second impeachment, of course, um, he was uh, he was at the end of his term. In any case, he he made a speech that uh, expressed criticism of President Trump for questioning the results of the election, for uh, uh, in t uh, basically encouraging the riot. But, you know, I don't think that that was the moment for senatorial leadership that Nancy Pelosi had been hoping for from Mitch McConnell. It was pretty much, it was pretty much after the fact. And then shortly thereafter, he seemed to resume support for Donald Trump. And, you know, I found myself wondering what Speaker Pelosi might have thought then, but maybe you don't know. Here's something from Matt. He says, congrats, Susan, on another wonderful biography. We all think we know Speaker Pelosi. So what was the thing that surprised you most about her as you did research? And also, what would you say was the funniest moment, dub bars aside, that you experienced interviewing Madam Speaker? So thanks, thanks for those those great questions. You know, the I'd mentioned earlier that the we went through a couple iterations of the title, um, and this goes to the question about the biggest surprise. The first title when I signed the contract for the book was Madam Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Ark 
of power. And then after a couple of months for a year, we made it the test of power. But at the end, we made it the lessons of power. And that's because the more I knew about Tommy the Elder and big Nancy D'Alessandro, it was clear to me that Nancy Pelosi applies the lessons she learned um, at their feet, at from her parents, as they <laughs> uh, got power, kept power, wielded power uh, in Little Italy and in Baltimore. And she is, people think of her as being uh, San Francisco liberal, and that's true, but she is, she is the political child of Baltimore and those New Deal parents of hers. Uh, and so that was the, I thought that was the biggest surprise and something that's quite fundamental in understanding who Nancy Pelosi is. Um, there were, you know, there were a couple, uh, uh, she, there were some moments that I really uh, in, enjoyed in the the interviews I had with her. Here's, here's one that's not so much funny, but it was touching because Nancy Pelosi doesn't show a lot of emotion. She's pretty disciplined. Uh, but I found uh, in the archives, the papers of Jack Murtha, who was an old style congressman from Pittsburgh, now deceased. Uh, he had been an important ally for Nancy Pelosi in that first leadership race against Steny Hoyer. And I found handwritten notes in his papers where he talked about Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and this is, he was a pretty crusty guy. He was, a, had, he had been a Marine. Uh, he wrote about how the old guys were reluctant to elect her to the leadership, but that she was among the best political minds he wow. had ever known. And when I showed her those notes, she was really touched. I think tears welled in her eyes. And she asked me if she could keep the copies of the notes, which of course I did. What do you suppose it makes? What do you suppose she has that makes her such a superb politician? I think she understands the motivation of others. She <laughs> understands a lot about her members. She knows why they're in politics, what it is that's important to them. It's different for each one of them. And that makes it possible when there's a big piece of legislation like the Affordable Care Act that she wants to get through, she can make a tailor-made appeal that gets their vote. And that is goes back, I think, to some of the training she got as a mother herself where you're trying to get five kids to do what you want them to do, you figure out how you're going to move them from point A to point B, and then you do it. And it's very much like that being a congressional leader. Another question. What would she consider her greatest personal disappointment? Hmm. That's that's interesting question because she never expresses regret <laughs> She doesn't acknowledge mistakes and she doesn't uh, express a regret. Um, you know, she, she and Barack Obama pushed through a climate change bill uh, in that first Congress uh, after he was elected. And it was controversial. She had to really twist arms. Uh, it didn't go anywhere in the Senate. So it turned to be, out to be an exercise in futility. It cost Democrats seats in the midterm election because people from districts in Pennsylvania and L Ohio had voted for it uh, at her behest and then lost. That was one of the reasons that they lost seats. And I think that that might be something she regrets, although I have to concede that I did not get her to admit that that was something she regrets. Susan, <clears throat> pardon me. What about her relationship with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they had a rift, and you interviewed the speaker shortly after that rift occurred. You know, they had a huge rift in 2019 when the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the three other members of the squad defected from Democrats on an important vote on an immigration bill. And that started uh, some very public back and forth uh, between them. Uh, 
And it culminated in an angry meeting of the Democratic House Democratic Caucus, a closed meeting. And I happened to be interviewing her that afternoon. Uh, and she was wound up. She was, uh, she doesn't really get it agitated, but she was wound up in the interview. And I, I asked her about her relationship with uh, AOC. And first she said there wasn't anything to ask about and she acted annoyed at the question. But then she said that there are people who come to Washington to take holy pictures like they're pious and pure. And there are people who come to Washington to do things and legislate. And she indicated that she put the squad in that first category and that was not praise from Nancy Pelosi. You know, that said, I think you have to say there's some similarities between the two of them and between, especially between a young Nancy Pelosi and AOC today, disruptive politicians willing to challenge the establishment, uh, not necessarily paying all that much attention to seniority, standing up for liberal causes. Na uh, Nancy Pelosi told me there was a point that she saw some of herself in AOC and that there was a point when she was a organizer uh, that she couldn't understand why politicians would make these compromises. But of course, now she does. Of course she does. Here's a question from Marianne, who says, please talk about the speaker's clothing style <laughs> and her husband's role in it. Is it true he chooses her designer suits? So I don't think Paul Pelosi chooses everything Nancy Pelosi wears, <clears throat> but I think that um, I was told that even when their kids were young, he would do a lot of the shopping for them. Really? And that, and that, uh, uh, that for her as well, he sometimes picks out clothes he thinks she will like. You know, she dresses beautifully, classically, uh, in designer clothes, in beautiful uh, colors, simple styles, very unfussy. Um, but I don't think she's, I don't think that she cares that much about her clothes. I mean, she, it's funny, she dresses beautifully, but she wears the same clothes over and over again, like most of us do. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's not top of mind for her, uh, what she's wearing. She but has, don't you think color is top of mind for her? Well, yes. She wears, she, she, I think she does pay attention to color and the color she wears are, are beautiful. And look good on her. And she's worn, you know, now in this past terrible year, she very early on began to wear beautiful masks, right? Um, masks of beautiful prints. Uh, there's a boutique uh, in Virginia, in suburban Virginia, where she's gotten a lot of them. Uh, and she's made a little bit of a statement, I think, with her mask, especially at a time when President Trump was refusing to wear a mask. Nancy Pelosi early on made a point of wearing a mask as she does to this day. So what do you see as her role now as she leads the House Democrats who are themselves more than a little divided? How is she dealing with that? How is she dealing with the kinds of instincts that those on the far left have with those who are more moderate? How is she dealing with, I don't know, the likes of, I'm not going to mention any names, but how is she dealing with it? So this is what she's been dealing with for some time, right? Since she was began the speakership in 2018, <clears throat> there are about three dozen, two to three dozen members who won districts that Trump carried. And there are very liberal members of Congress who really want, think, want to be bolder, want to do the Green New Deal and Medicare for all. And she's managed to hold them together. It's really a sign of her skill as a leader that she's, that the Democrats have not fractured. And of course, very important now, because at the moment, she can only lose two Democratic votes. Right and get something through. That is the narrowest of margins in modern times for any majority. Um, and in a, in a, so it's a test of her skill, although it's also a fact that 
Democrats realize there is no room for factions if they, in fact, want to get something through. She got through that big uh, COVID relief bill. Um, now the big infrastructure bill is going to come up. That'll be another test of her ability to thread that needle. But it is something that she has experience doing. Do you think she'll stay on beyond the 22 election should she win re-election? So I, she did not tell me this, but it's my judgment that this will be her last term. Uh, really? She, she had made a commitment in the 2018 that she would serve one more term and then possibly one more term with a higher margin of threshold when she was being challenged for the speakership in 2018. Um, and that wasn't written into the rules. Uh, she hasn't made the kind of Sherman-esque statement that we could all quote from, but it is my sense that this is her last term as speaker. You know, she's 81 years old. Uh, she's got nine grandchildren. Uh, she might want to write her memoirs. I hope she does. I would love to read them. Seems to me she'd make a good ambassador to Italy. Um, so to the Vatican or to the Vatican. So um, that's it might, I think it is likely, though not guaranteed that this is her last term. One uh, of our viewers asked, how has Nancy Pelosi paved the way for women? Well, I, th I think she clearly has just by the fact of, of challenging the establishment, which was at that point, entirely led by men, uh, by succeeding in defeating them and getting into the leadership herself, by serving as the highest ranking woman in the history of the American government. That is quite an achievement. And she has, she has championed the election of more women to Congress as well. I think so, I think both by her actions, but also by her example, uh, she has meant something for women uh, in this country, especially for women who have political aspirations. In the epilogue, you quote Hillary Clinton, who said, I think she has been one of the most significant figures in modern American history. To what extent do you think historians will agree with that assessment? Well, I think, uh, and, and I tried to interview congressional historians for the book, including uh, your good friend, Norm Ornstein, who of course knows a lot about Congress. I think the consensus of scholars is that she is the most consequential Speaker of the House since Sam Rayburn, the most consequential wow. Speaker of the House in modern times. Wow. Uh, and that's not because of her gender breakthrough, it's because of the legislation that she has managed to get past. What do you think you personally have taken from your interviews with Nancy Pelosi? What do you take personally into your heart from what you've learned? You know, um, I, I, I actually think, I think I've learned I thought I learned some things from Barbara Bush when I did that biography, and I would say the same for Nancy Pelosi. Um, she is quite gracious. Um, she is uh, considerate of others, even though she can be tough as nails as a legislature legislator. Um, she has a pretty thick skin. Um, that's an important lesson uh, to learn. She is very much power not for its own sake, but power to get things done that you think should be done. Um, all those were uh, uh, lessons I learned. And she's, she's also just such, she's impressive. It's a, it's a privilege to interview people, Democrats and Republicans, men and women, who have done things that are important and consequential for our country. She has been at the center of American public affairs in the 21st century in a leadership role. So it was a, it was a privilege to have the chance to uh, write this biography. And for me, it was a privilege to read this biography. And 
as always, Susan, to talk with you about writing. Thank you so much for doing this book. Such a great read. Diane, thank you so much. And now back to Brad Graham. Wonderful moderating, uh, Diane, as always. Uh, and Susan, there's, there's so many great uh, revealing stories in the book. I know you've been able to touch uh, this evening on, on only a, a sampling of them. Right. So I hope everyone watching reads the book to get a comprehensive portrait of the speaker that you provide. Uh, there's a link in the chat column for purchasing a Madam Speaker. Uh, to all the viewers out there, thanks for tuning in. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well-read. Thank you, Susan. <laughs>